So I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker today. We have the wonderful Kieran Hadka from UCSF. She's a dosimetrist. She has over 20 years of experience and formerly was at Memorial Sloan Kettering. She went through the transition of 2D to 3D to IMRT and so brings some really valuable perspectives on what to look for plan evaluation. And I know as a resident, this is a really tricky topic that a lot of times we don't get focused education and we have to evaluate plans, but we do, maybe we don't have really a good method for doing this. So thank you, everybody. My name is Karen Hurtka. Once again, I'm a dosimetrist at uh, UCSF, and we're going to talk about head and neck plan evaluation. And, you know, just want to apologize in advance if some of this information is uh, really basic for you, but just wanted to share my experience with head and neck planning as I've been in the field for many, many years. So we're going to uh, mostly talk about 10 important things to look out for and five mistakes to avoid when reviewing a head and neck plan. Okay, here we go. Sorry. So transitioning from 2D uh, CRT to IMRT to VMAT. So mostly at our center, we have been doing VMAT for all of our head and neck cases and occasionally IMRT. Um, both equally gives, in my experience, a, pr a pretty good plan. VMAT may be a little uh, faster to treat. It's one advantage, but either option are good. So why is IMRT and VMAT is advantages, has adva some advantages over uh, 2D plans. And one is the obvious one, which is to spare sensitive structures like parotids, you know, which gives a better quality of uh, function to the patients. And also we can treat irregularly shaped lesions. And as you know, all the head and neck contours are in all shorts and being able to really have the dose tightly around just the target and spare all the normal structures surrounding it means we can spare uh, a lot of normal tissue and give patient a good quality radiation. And a dose painting, which is, as you know, most most of our head and neck cases that are done with the IMRT VMAT are dose painted with anywhere from two to four different dose levels. And it's very easy to do with, with a modulated therapy. And also you can dose escalate and more recently dose deescalate. And initially because there was, you know, you can have a better control and they were studies done to potentially increase the dose uh, while keep still being able to spare the normal structures and so on and so forth. And lastly, but not the least, is retreat cases. It's almost impossible to treat headache case, uh, cases, uh, retreat cases with 2D or 3D. It's, you can do it, it's just a very painfully done. With IMRT and VMAT, it makes it much easier where, you know, Ford, for an example, has, trained, has seen, you know, full dose to 4,500 centigrade, and now you are, patient comes back and you need to stay completely off of it. So having a modulated therapy definitely makes it easier. But all of this comes with a great responsibility, which is, you know, things the technology has gone complicated and, and there's a lot to look at. And so it requires a very careful plan evaluation and, and some different uh, skills. So we'll just dive right into that and uh, go through them. So not sure how many people have um, heard of this acronym called CBCHOP, which stands for Contours, Beams, Coverage, Heterogeneity, Organs at Risk, and Prescription. It's really a systematic, easy way to kind of go through your plan evaluation, really for any case, especially for hand and neck, where, where you are just looking at so many things, and it makes it easier if you kind of follow this method to evaluate the plan. And I have a website here if people wants to refer to the paper. But uh, so we're going to use this today to do the uh, plan evaluation, learn all about the plan evaluation. Okay. Okay. So contours. I know this may seem basic, but are all GTVs contoured? You know, it's, as you know, there's a lot to contour in head and neck planning, and it's easily can be missed, and it has happened. 
um, enough times in my career that I felt that it, it, it requires a very attention and careful attention. And, you know, if you do have a PET or MRI at your institution that, you know, you can use that to verify it. And so make sure that all the GTEs are contoured. And next is, are the expansion on the GTVs are correct? So a uh, reason why I bring this up is because, you know, generally it's not just one node that you're expanding. There's like several nodes and you're sometimes go back and forth and the expansions are done. And then you go back and you're like, oh, I think I need to change this GTV. And then people forget to re-expand, uh, give appropriate expansion. So double and triple check before uh, moving on to you drawing your organs at risk, but that your uh, target volumes are uh, all in and they're expanded uh, appropriately. And third one is organs at risk. So yeah, there's a lot to contour here and I'm very grateful at UCSF that our residents and doctors draw them all, so thank you. <laughs> And so some of, the, some of the structures I wanted to make specific points about is spinal cord, for an example here, that, you know, there should be no gap between spinal cord and brainstem. So if you see, you know, a gap right here, and one of the reasons why I say this, is that when we as a planner are optimizing on both brainstem and spinal cord, if there is a gap in between, the dose can easily just a creep up in between that space. And unless you kind of pick that up in your review later on, that's great. But so it's always important that that is a one contiguous structure, so, so to speak. And then esophagus. We, esophagus should be contoured roughly around the target. Generally, I put one CM past the most inferior PTV for true mean uh, dose evaluator. Uh, for dose evaluation. And the reason why is, you know, sometimes the contour is, for esophagus contour is done all the way down to the chest. And when we look at the mean dose of it, it looks great. And that's because half of the uh, esophagus is nowhere near the field. So, you know, you kind of want to get a true mean dose evaluation. So kind of, if the physician has drawn a very long one as a planner, it should be just uh, really evaluate, um, optimizing and evaluating on, uh, uh, on an esophagus just around the target. And then optics. So cases like nasopharynx or where, you know, you have a very extensive 70 gray and a 59, 40 volume that's creeping up in between the eyes or near the eyes, you may want to connect and optic nerve. But pretty much for the same reason as, as I explained earlier between the spinal cord and brain stem. So if there is a, sp a space in between uh, those two structures, and when you're opt uh, trying to constrain the max dose to the optics, which is uh, very crucial, that it, it can potentially, you know, dose can creep up in. Mm -hmm. And I just um, want to make a, a point here, Karen. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when we're looking at our OARs, mm -hmm. we look at our DVHs and we look at our plans and we see if all the constraints were met. Mm -hmm. But if you didn't draw it right or you mm -hmm. missed a slice, uh -huh especially when you're doing IMRT or inverse treatment planning, the, the plan might have found a way to do it that's actually creating a very hot dose in that slice that you missed. Right. So the, that's why it's so important to make sure that there's no gap, not even a single gap, because that could be the slice where you're getting too much dose. And, exactly. Uh, yep. Yeah, good point. Yes, absolutely. And then we have oral cavity, and generally we look at the mean dose of the, of the healthy oral cavity. So even if the oral cavity is drawn by the physician as a whole structure, uh, when I do my plan, I always optimize on the oral cavity minus the PTV, and I also use that for evaluation. And I also have a structural artifact here, and a reason why is we... You know, a lot of our head and neck patients, they get, they get a, a dental work done. And when the CT gets done, you have a lot of artifact that's get created and gives you a poor dosimetry. So it's important that we contour uh, the artifact and override the density to water to get a true dosimetry in that area. Because, you know, our beams are generally going through it. And I mean, 
there has been times where you forget to do it, your plan is done, you submit it, and the physics comes back and makes you redo it because and it's totally fair. So it's uh, something I wanted to bring it up. And uh, some of the new GE scanners has um, a feature called the uh, IMR, Metal Artifact Reduction, which automatically reduces that scatter, uh, which is really nice because that's one less thing for uh, treatment planners to think about. And we have the uh, rest of this critical organs that we contour for all of our head and neck cases. So this is generally what is gets contoured and we evaluate. Uh, brachial plexus, not all the time, but yeah. So next is beams. So at uh, UCSF, we do our planning on a planning software called RayStation. And our patients get treated on true beam. We have three true beams with uh, millennium MLC, five millimeter MLC, and they all the machines have ability to do cone beam and KV imaging. So a little bit about the beam arrangement for IMRT and VMAT. So if you're doing an IMRT, anywhere between seven to nine beams are ideal for for this case for most head and cases. One of the important things to remember is to avoid entering through the shoulders. One, because it's a very inefficient beam, and B, it's not necessary to treat patients' shoulders when you can easily just tilt the uh, uh, beams a little bit anterior and posterior and avoid it. And for VMAT, anywhere, we use anywhere from two to four arcs. In most cases, two arcs gives us a very good plan. Some of the more complicated ones can benefit from having uh, one or two extra arcs. And you know, some of the tumors are really large and overlapping with a lot of critical organs. And then planner, we are really trying to uh, get the, uh, meet the dose constraints for some of the ORRs that we like to spare. And then it creeps up uh, your hotspot. So by adding an arc or two can help benefit to reduce the inhomogeneity. And therefore in those cases, I sometimes will use three to four arcs. Uh, Kira, this is Nikki. Yes. Another thing to mention about the, the arcs is that it's important to vary the collimator rotation as well when you're using yes. uh, the multiple yeah. arcs. That, that it, uh, that's a very good point, Nikki. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, so it's uh, important to have a different collimation angle just to feather the beam. This way you're getting the most e efficient technique from both angles. Otherwise, you're if you have the same uh, collimator angle, you're basically treating with the same beam twice. So that's that's a very good point. Thanks. So next is coverage. So we generally evaluate PTV coverage on target that is five millimeter away from the skin. So dosimetrists create their own PTV valve for review. And it's important that all our PTV gets 95% is isodose line cover uh, with isodose 95% coverage. And if it's not covering with 95% isodose line, you want to evaluate where the coverage is being compromised and why, and discuss that with the physician. So it's uh, really, really important that you, you when you're reviewing all this, that you A, scroll through every single slice to evaluate isodose line and make sure there is no unexpected cold spot in the target or hotspot outside your target or OARs. And you know, your DVH can give you a lot of meaningful details, but I think only way you're going to really assess is by scrolling through the slice up and down. And you can see it on this slice right here on the right-hand side where you have 70 gray isotopes line that is carving around the mandible. And that is intentional just to meet the mandible uh, dose constraint, which is something other physicians like to meet. But while we do that, we also make sure that our GTV is well covered. And as you see, this green contour is covered pretty well with, with 70 gray, while we're also able to spare mandible. Okay, so heterogeneity hotspots. So it's very important that as a planner, you kind of get carried away with trying to spare your organs at risk and forget to look at your max dose point and, you know, Everything comes with a cost, and you know while while your DVHs to organs at risk look good, you can potentially have very high dose in the area. So you want to make sure that you evaluate your max heterogeneity, and it falls on the GTV. Generally, is the ideal place, or basically where the highest dose volume is. 
And we like to keep the hotspot below 115%, but for most head and neck cases, you know, you'll, you'll be um, able to get 110 or 112% hotspot. But in some of the complicated cases, 115% max dose is acceptable. And also you want to make sure that the GTV is in the area where you expect it will be, not in your GTV or CTV, but um, we're prob- uh, you know, near, near, the, near the skin, as you see it right here, and things like that. Okay, so OARs. Uh, so there is a lot to contour, and there's a lot of information on this page. And so this is um, a screenshot from our planning system called Ray Station, and this is basically those statistics for again, uh, targets and organs. And you want to you want to ask yourself like what what are you, what organs are you trying to spare? So generally, you know, you, you want to at least spare one parotid. If both can be done, that's great. But if not, you never want to compromise the high dose. GTV to meet the dose constraint on the opposite side. But this DVH gives you really good detail this of the mean dose, uh, max dose, and the, and, the mean do, and the mean dose. So here, so we don't have like an absolute mean or max dose for a base station. We have D99, which is 99% uh, of the volume gets this dose. And also this is, I, I really like looking at this DVH stats for GTVs to make sure that I'm not missing any GTV for my plan. And, you know, it should get 7,000 centigrade and it is well covered. So that's um, one, one place that I like to look at as a, you know, last uh, check to make sure that uh, nothing is missed as far as the GTV goes. And we look at some of the average doses of the oral cavity minus PTV. This is what I had contoured. Uh, you know, the, there was a, the reason why I probably did that is because um, it was overlapping with the target. So I just wanted to make sure that I look at the true uh, mean dose constraint. And then also uh, esophagus, uh, you know, keep it below 35 gray and epiglottis and parotids and so on and so forth. So, you know, you have spared one parotids and other one uh, is not meeting the constraint. And here on the far right side, D1, which is 1% of the volume gets this dose. And you, you know, this is a, this is a, uh, this is good for organs like brainstem and, uh, spinal cord and some of the optic structures that you're evaluating. So yeah, so this has a lot of information, but once again, this should be done in conjunction with, with scrolling through each uh, CT slice and making sure that everything looks um, okay and the coverage looks good. And if this is a a retreatment, what do you want to consider? You know, so these are some of the conversation you want to have up front with, with, with your physicians. And if you have the prior treatment record, you know, uh, we like to generally composite them before the planning starts and establish that what organs at risk could be potentially problematic. And, you know, sometimes cord is a very common one where it has seen all the dose and we're trying to keep it uh, below 10 gray or sometimes even 5 gray and things of uh, such a, and larynx dose, brainstem, esophagus, and optics. So if you have this conversation up front and kind of establish uh, OAR constraints, which are something out of the conventional ones, then there's a less back and forth going between the planner and the physician when you're trying to come up with a retreatment plan. And then prescription. So you want to double check that the uh, plan that you're that you have come up with matches all the prescription that the physician has put in in their in their chart, and it should be consistent because and these are some of the common fractionation that we see with head and neck uh, cancers. So it's important that you have verified that, uh, double checked it, and if it doesn't make sense, always 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 uh, important that you ask and uh, verify and double check and triple check. And then bolus. So if you're using a bolus um, in your plan, you know, there are one or two ways. They, if sometimes a physician likes to put them at the time of the simulation. And in that case, it's pretty well noted in, in the patient's chart where the bolus is, how thick is the bolus. And we, we, we don't need to put one at the treatment planning system. But for some reason, 
uh, physician decides to put a uh, bolus later on, and sometimes they put it for cases where GTB is broaching uh, within five millimeter of the skin, and they want to add a, a patch of three to five millimeter bolus, then we, we can create them a treatment planning system. And uh, if we do that, and if you do that, you just want to make sure you want, because it's generally a custom bolus, it's not over the entire field, it's over the uh, gross tumor volume. So you, so treatment, a treatment planner will make a custom bolus and will go to the machine on the first day of the treatment and uh, place it. And then, you know, you graph it, you chart it. So anybody who's treating the patient that day knows where to put the bolus on. And sometimes you can also mark the area where the bolus goes on the mask. So uh, these are some of the important details about the bolus. And then last but not least is five most common mistakes that are found. So, you know, this is kind of circling back to my first slide about the GTVs. You know, it's there's a lot to contour and, you know, people are busy in their clinics and I understand. So, so, but sometimes in a rush, you have forgotten to pick up on a GTV. So it's always, always, always important that all the GTVs have been picked up in your contouring. And, you know, if you do have access to PET or MRI, you have verified it on there and then the appropriate expansions are done. And the next one is not all of the PTV 70 targets were contoured with 70 gray isodose line. And so I have worked at places where physicians have drawn multiple PTV 70 volumes. So then it's planners, a treatment planner's job to make sure that they have optimized on all of those 70 gray volumes and have uh, treated it all. So it could be a mistake from a planner or an oversight where they forget to they have forgotten to kind of cover that. It may be in your target at some like 59.40, but it may not be in, in the, in the isodose line within which you uh, were intended to have it in. So that's uh, number two. And now to number three. So new planning directive was added verbally after the planning was complete. Oh, can we uh, take off the dose from here for an example mandible? So for those of you uh, who are not familiar with planning directive is, we have at our clinic a planning directive for all of our patients that gives um, a detailed information on uh, everything that's intended for the patient, relevant to patient treatments, including what kind of imaging patient's gonna have. And uh, most importantly for a planner is, is, is the PTV coverage that the physician is looking for and dose constraints for all the OAR. And they are generally listed in anywhere from, a, they give, they're given a priority of anywhere between one to five. In our clinic, we use one as a hard constraint that we absolutely must meet. And then a priority that is five, that is, is you know, you, if, if you can't meet it, that's okay. But it's very important to remember that just because the priority is, you know, it's not hard constraint, you still as a planner try to optimize on the structures and reduce the toxicity to the patient as much as possible. So, so yeah, so we have, I have Mendeville as an example that it's, uh, that you want to um, meet the dose constraint and it's hard constraint and you can compromise the target just to meet it, but make sure that it's discussed with the physician and look at in your 3D slices that how the isodoses look around mandible and your target is acceptable and makes sense. So thinking that a plan is finished once it meets all the OAR those constraints. So sort of going into the topic that I was just saying, that in dosimetry we 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 say uh, we often say don't meet it, beat it. So what we try to do, we don't just try to meet the dose constraint. It's Prodded mean dose is 26. Yeah, of course, we want to get 26, but we try to uh, reduce the dose to it as much as possible. And that's for all of the structures, wherever you can. And I think, you know, with experience, it comes that you know which uh, organs that you're able to, you're able to get worse dose to. So, and you try to strive for ALARA, basically as low as reasonably achievable. And, you know, at the same time, you want to make sure that you're not breaking uh, your PTV coverage or a misanthropy plan in other ways. And, you know, this is really uh, good for the patient. It reduces toxicity and complications. And 
if they were to get retreated, then you know, and you know, you, you capture those loads, then you have some room to give in your retreatment plan. And then next one is going through the shoulder for fixed beam IMRT plans. It's uh, really an absolute unnecessary thing, and physics will kick back your plan if it's if it's going through the shoulder. So try to avoid it from the beginning. Otherwise, yeah, it's uh, no fun to replan for such a silly mistake. And also, if you're doing VMET plan and a patient is very has a very broad shoulders you want to make sure that you have the entire CT data set. And if you don't, uh, then your shoulders are cut off and you're using the full, you know, you're using full arcs. And another reason why your plan can get kicked back if, if your CT is, entire CT is not in your field of view and you have planned on, on that CT data set. So then comes the reviewing of a plan. You know, it's like when you open up a plan, I'm sure everybody who has seen this plan is like, it's very overwhelming. There's like lots of colors, lots of lines, and it's, it's just confusing, even for somebody who has looked at head and necks like thousands of times. So first thing I like to do is just turn off everything and look at your gross, like, you know, your target. And in this case, you have, you see, there's a gross tumor a lymph node that that got missed in the um, in our expansion so things like that can be picked up and it's better that we do it from the beginning not later on after the plan is done so sort of circling back but it's always good to double and triple check this sort of things and yeah look at one thing at a time it just makes it easier because there's just so much contouring done in head and neck that you know in the degree uh, in the degree of importance, you know, you look at your GTVs, you look at your OARs from brain stems and the spinal cord to parotids and larynx and so on and so forth. So hope, yeah, that you find this CB chop method to be very helpful to evaluate really any plan. I think it's just very systematic. It's, it makes sense. It's, yeah. I, I, I love it. And it was something that was introduced to me just recently. So for any new residents or dosimetrist or anybody working in the field, I think it's a, a good uh, reference to have. And obviously, you know, one becomes perfect with practice. So keep practicing and you'll, you'll become an expert in no time. <laughs>